Come on in, everyone. All right, I got my iPad working now, or at least I did earlier. We'll see what happens. <laughs> it was working about two minutes ago. We'll see if it continues to work. Uh, anyways, let's let everybody get in. It looks like we got like 21 of you. Does anybody have any questions before we get started? Hopefully you've all attempted uh, your homework, gotten your account made in my lab and mastering and started doing homework one. Uh, you can even start, of course, practice test one that's available already. That covers chapters one and two. Uh, definitely should start playing with those practice tests once you finish some work for chapters one and chapter two. Uh, of course, chapter one homework, I think, just became available this morning. Uh, chapter two did, uh, even though we haven't covered chapter two yet. So uh, I wouldn't start messing with that until you actually had me cover the material. But I definitely try to read the material before I, before your instructor covers it, i.e. me. Uh, I would say you need to memorize the metric system uh, just out to Terra, which I'm going to give you a goofy mnemonic I made up. Hopefully, I can come up with a better one because evidently my my brain is chronically stuck in like fifth grade. So, you know, I'm going to have something goofy in, in my mnemonic. Yeah, I got a question. Um, for the homework, I thought, mm -hmm. and this may be just because I'm used to the Lumen Learning or the other software we were using, Lumen or right. HM or whatever. I thought we could like retry it for a better grade or retry the questions and that counted towards it. And if not, then it's just one tenth. Gotcha. I, I did set that up, but you know what? I just remembered. Uh, I don't think it was your class that I adjusted that in. I'm going to go set that. Uh, what I did was that I, I allow you to do it up to a, uh, well, I allow you to do it late, but you lose 4% per day that you are late, but I blocked that or I stopped that at 20%. So once you've lost 20%, you can only, if you get 100, you can get an 80, no matter how late it is. So- No, I'm, um, not, I'm not talking about lateness. I'm talking about attempts. Right, I was just telling the, the general program. Uh, so yeah, in yeah, addition yeah. to that, I was you're supposed to be able to do it up to six times. So- Yeah, um, no, I missed one and it, it knocked it down for me. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll look into that and see what it can do. It might not be able to do it on this first test, but all the I mean, on this first homework assignment, but you will be able to on the on the rest of them. So thanks for asking me about that. I'll definitely check it out right after class. Anyone else? With multiple choice, though, it's a little different with multiple choice, like the uh, if there's five choices, they only give you like four attempts or something. But yeah, when it's actual numerical, they give you a, a number of attempts. But yeah, no, they gave us attempts, but it was it's counting a, like I, I'll pose mine out. Like I missed three or four of them on my mm -hmm. first attempt. They got it right on the second attempt because of six figs, and it still counted the canvas as negative or you know less it than hundred. Yeah, right, I'll look at that scoring again and uh, maybe even take a picture of the definition of how it's scored uh, and uh, post that on our page so we'll know. Okay. Anyone else have a question? I have a question. Yes, sir. Uh, I still don't have the book. Um, I paid for the book today and I tried to like get you know, get access to the book and everything. It's asking me for a course ID and I don't know what that course ID is. I was told explicitly numerous times by every <laughs> publisher I've used is uh, since I deeply integrate my textbook uh, or excuse me, my homework system with our uh, canvas that I'm not 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 supposed to give a course ID. It's just a number they give me when I make a course. Uh, what you should do and what should work is you should be able to click on, say, chapter one homework. It'll make you make an account. If you don't already have one, uh, it'll have you uh, create a password and then it'll give you a choice of putting in the, the access code that you got when you buy the, the package or you can take a two week grace period. I think it is uh, when you do that, then you'll go in and off in the left hand side, it'll say Pearson e-text and you click on there and that's where your electronic version of your book is. All right. I'll try to uh, I'll try that out. All right. Thank you. No problem. Has anybody actually been able to do that yet? Has anybody actually been able to like see their e-text? Yeah, just to I make sure. used Canvas to get it and it worked just fine. Yeah, definitely go through Canvas. That's the main thing. That's that's if I gave you the course ID, you could actually go in 
not through Canvas, and then you do your homework and it would never show up in my grade book. That's that's why they tell me not to give you the course ID. So yeah, make sure you always go through Canvas, but thank you for that information. Whoever that was, was it Adrian maybe? It's weird, okay. I, I just have a hard time figuring out what's what. So <laughs> anyways, uh, I think we'll go ahead and get started then if no one has any other questions. Uh, sometimes I'm gonna jump right in and start talking about the topic and that's because i'm a goober i'm really excited about physics i love it and i start talking about it immediately you can always stop me and say hey mr younger i had a homework question before we get started uh if the homework questions take up too much time or are just too long to answer i'll say okay well, let's talk about that at the end of class and i'll do that and that gives you a little bit more time as well uh if you're in a rush to go to your lab which is sometimes reasonable uh we can always schedule a zoom meeting at a different time to help you with it as well and i, I try to unless we talk about stuff that's personal i try to take those zoom meetings and publish them as well so if i have a zoom meeting with a student where i'm working some problems i'll post that unless you explicitly tell me hey i don't want my name up there so Make sure you let me know too if uh, if you have a problem with your name appearing on my YouTube channel because I usually click on my icon of me uh, before uh, before I start taping and it stays there. But sometimes as you log in, it'll show your name across here until I click on mine a second time. So if anybody's like in hiding, maybe you got the mob looking for you. Make sure you let me know so I'll block it out. I don't I don't want you to have any problems because I'm a goober or won't pay attention or something. So please just send me an email. Let me know if that's an issue for you guys. Uh, you know, the man might be trying to get you. So anyways, uh, no more questions before we start. Oh, let's see. So my uh, mastering, which I link is it in Canvas. Uh, in Canvas, you can off click to the left hand side. It'll say uh, my lab and mastering. That's one way you can go directly to the website. Uh, another way you can do is just click on chapter one homework or chapter one conceptual. That's another way to get in there as well. Uh, for tests and exams, will you give us the important unit conversions or problems or do you need to memorize them? The only uh, unit, uh, unit, unit conversions that I think you really should know are ones that I'm going to uh, show you today. Uh, and basically that includes the conversions back and forth between within the metric system and then uh, the critical ones that I think most of you probably know. For instance, you probably know that uh, one mile is 5,280 feet. You probably know that one foot is 12 inches. You probably know uh, that one inch is 2.54 centimeters. And that's exactly true. That's one with an infinite number of zero decimal places, uh, a decimal places of zero is equal to 2.54 followed by an infinite number of zeros centimeters. Okay. So that one I suspect you might not necessarily know off the top of your head. You probably heard it and then remembered it, but, uh, that one I would commit to memory. And then of course, 60 minutes and a set and, a, uh, hour and 60 seconds in a minute or 3600 seconds in uh an hour those are those are like the only conversion factors uh you are perfectly welcome to uh take a screenshot or print out a screenshot of uh the inside uh covers of your textbook you don't necessarily have those inside covers if you got a binder ready book but I'm pretty sure if you look in the e-text, they'll have something that represents the inside cover. And that has conversion factors. Uh, it has constants like the uh, electron mass, the proton mass, the electron charge, the neutron mass, uh, the Bohr radius, just a bunch of stuff that are the gravitational constant from Newton's law of gravity. You're welcome to have those and integral tables and de derivative tables if you want. OK, other than that, you're just allowed an equation sheet. And my role for the equation sheet is any equation that is numbered in your textbook, you're allowed to use. And any ones I tell you other than that, you could use, but mainly it's just those. I am trying to get a copy of all the uh, numbered equations and I contacted my book rep and she said, oh, yeah, sure. You just do this. And I went there and I haven't found it yet. So I'm not sure she understood what I was talking about, but we'll work on that. Anything else? So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, one thing we, we have to realize is that when you're working with numbers, uh, there's a bunch of things going on. For starters, there's error in any measurement you make. Uh, you might look at, say, a, a, let's say a device that the government paid 
you know, four billion dollars for that's just supposed to measure the length of rods or something. Let's just pretend this thing exists. Uh, and it spits out, you know, the decimal uh, or the value down to like four decimal places. Even that thing has error. Trust me. OK, uh, maybe the decimal, uh, maybe the error is one in that fourth decimal place, but it's definitely an error. And in fact, uh, that's the general rule. If you're looking at a digital display of something that made a measurement, you can assume the error should be at least as big as one in the last decimal place. So if your speedometer, for instance, read to you know one decimal place and it was said you locked your cruise control on 55.0 miles per hour, you could record that as five uh 55.0 plus or minus 0 0.1 miles per hour because I just put a one in that last decimal place. Uh, you can try all you want. You can say, okay, well, I'm going to measure this meter stick or I'm going to measure this rod by using magnifying glass. Okay, well, now you can get two decimal places or three decimal places. You're like, yeah. Well, then you can also take it and say, okay, well, I'm going to get even further. I'm going to use a microscope. And then maybe you get the four decimal places. And then you say, okay, well, I'm going to get even further. I'm going to use a scanning electron microscope like we use to, uh, you know, orient atoms and write the word IBM or the name IBM and atoms. Well, you can do that. And what would happen is, is quite odd. You'd look at the end of that rod and what you'd see is it going, ah like this because the atoms are actually vibrating and everywhere so that there's really no well-defined end to the rod. So even at that scenario, there, you're going to have error and that's just a matter of uh, life situations that you're going to have to deal with. So in the lab, in the, in the lowest level science labs, we use sig figs or significant, significant digits or significant figures to deal with that. And they are pretty good most of the time, but occasionally they are really, really bad. So really serious scientists don't mess very much with scientific, or excuse me, with significant figures or sig figs or significant digits. Uh, what they do is they use propagation of error formulas. And all of my lab teachers are supposed to be giving you at least one or two lessons on that. So I don't know who you have for lecture, I mean, for lab, but I think it's probably Maria. Uh, so she'll give you some introduction to that as well. And I can answer questions about that. That being said, once you realize that all numbers have error, you have to be able to say, well, what if I want to calculate the volume of something? I measure its, its height and then I measure its width and then I measure its depth or something like that. Each of those numbers had errors in them. And maybe I measured them, you know, 20 times because maybe the, the edges aren't that smooth. I'm using a nice veneer caliper and I measure them 20 times. What's the best estimate? Well, I think y'all know what the best estimate of the width would be if I measured the width 20 times. Anybody want to take a guess of that? What should I report if I made 20 measurements of the width? What average of them? Yes, very good. The average. You take the average. If there was some way where you happen to find out that certain trials had a lot of error and other trials had less error, you would want to weight it where the ones that had more more try or more error had less importance. And there is a way to do that. It's called a weighted average. But I'm never, ever, ever going to make you do anything like that in this class. I just want you to know it exists. So when you report the width, what that means is you're going to report your average of all the measurements you did. And then after the plus or minus, you might want to know what is that number that comes after the plus or minus? Well, it turns out statistically the best number to use there is something we call the standard error, which might make more sense if you realize it's also called the standard deviation of the mean. So if you took uh, a, a bunch of lab students and they all ran this experiment and you took their average, you took the standard deviation, you'd find that there's some very specific percentages. I forget the numbers, but it'll be in the propagation of error documents. You can also look it up on uh, uh, on Wikipedia. Most math and physics things in Wikipedia are actually pretty correct and only have typos. But it's around 67%, 63 or 65, I can't remember, some percentage of all other labs like ours running that same experiment are gonna find an average width of the width that we got 
plus one standard deviation and minus one standard devi deviation. In other words, there's a smallest number that's my mean minus a standard deviation. And then there's a largest number that's my mean plus a standard deviation. And what I'm saying is if you had 100,000 labs, uh, probably around 65,000 of those labs would have an average in between those two numbers, okay? Now, you don't really want that. What you want is at the end of the day, you want the total experiment to be run a million times and or 100,000 times. And then you want to find out what result they got for W from all of those experiments, not from those individual trials. So you then take what's called the standard error. And luckily, the formula is kind of complicated, but it's really simple. Once you have the standard deviation, you just take the standard deviation and divide it by the square root of the number of trials. So that mechanism will calculate the standard deviation, which is really calculating the mean and then subtracting each individual data point from the mean. So I take one of them, I do the subtraction, I square it, then I take another data point, do the subtraction I, and square it and keep doing that for all n trials. And then I take all those squared numbers and add them together and divide it by not n, but by n minus one for reasons you don't need to know, know. And then I take the square root of that. That's the standard deviation. Now, if you take that standard deviation and divide it by the square root of n, then you'll get the standard error. And that's what goes after the plus or minus. OK, so you'll learn more about that in your lab. I just wanted to make sure you all have heard this before. And uh, I've made a document that I released to my students. I'll put it on yours, uh, on your lab here, even though I, you don't have me for lab. I'll put it on your Canvas course here as well. So you can read it and start thinking about it. Uh, it's not that hard. Uh, the only thing is it does require calculus to do the propagation of error. Uh, so now if I have a, a width, a length, and a height, they're reported as a, a mean plus or minus a standard error in each case, unless, of course, the instrumental error is bigger than the standard error, then you have to use the instrumental error. But either way, you have a, a height, width, and, and depth that have a best value and an uncertainty. How do you actually calculate the volume now? Well, you multiply the best estimate of the height times the best estimate of the width times the best estimate of the depth, and that'll give you your best estimate of the volume. And you might have 82 decimal places on that, but you don't yet know where to round it to because where you round it to all depends on how much error you get. So there's a nice formula you can use that tells you how to relate those errors in width, height, and length, or depth, or whatever, to the error in the volume. And what you do is you round that error in the volume to one numerical value, in other words, one significant digit, and that's where you round the mean to. So that's the more robust way. I'll put a, a document, it's called Propagation of Error or something like that. I'll put that in week one module so you can follow that. Now, now that we got over the details of talking about numbers and how you use them in a lab setting, I need you to understand that in addition to a number, uh, there's something very important. You cannot just write down a number unless it happens to be a pure number like pi or the square root of two or something like that. You need to have a denominate number. That's the official wording of it. It's denominate, like, you know, denominations. So a denominate number is a number that has units associated with it. And the units are very important. And once you start working with units, you have to have everyone that works with your numbers agree on a standard for those units. So the units that we use in the United States, us and, and I think Liberia is the only other country using the system that we use in America is called the British system. And it's it's historical as opposed to analytical or logical or reasonable. For instance, if you've ever seen what I call the G-Man, which is this giant G with four Qs in it. And then inside of each Q, there's four Ps. And then inside of each P, there's two Cs. And then inside of each C, there's eight Os. That's historically how you would figure out how many quarts are in a gallon, how many pints are in a quart, how many cups are in a pint, how many ounces are in a cup, uh, how many cups are in a pint, all that sort of stuff. That is something we came up with historically just from what was convenient. And for some reason, us Americans decided to stay with it. Okay. Now, in the sciences, we have run away from that a long way. And in engineering, they're sort of trying to like 
they have something called a KIP in engineering. Anybody know what a KIP is? I kid you not. It's a it's a kilopound. It's a thousand a thousand pounds. They call it a KIP. Uh, and they have MIPS, which are mega pounds. So they're sort of trying to go into the metric system without going into the metric system. But anyways, we're going to work ex exclusively almost in the metric system. Occasionally, the book or me will give you numbers in the British system that probably for them to work in the equation that you learned in the book, you're probably going to have to put them into the system of units called the System Internationale, which was a system that sort of became the appropriate one right around the time of the French Revolution. Remember, the French Revolution was spawned after the Great Enlightenment, and the Enlightenment, of course, was also responsible for us thinking that we could rule ourselves. In other words, uh, self-rule of America, Americans deciding on laws and voting people to enforce said laws to make a government. That's what uh, the Enlightenment gave us. And in France, it gave them as a as a would be superpower or soon to be superpower when Napoleon took over uh, a reason to make a rational system. So the rational system came out to be you'd have a base unit. The base unit, for instance, for mass is supposed to be the gram, but nobody ever really uses grams. They always use kilograms. Uh, the base unit for the length is a meter. And the base unit for time is the second. So they actually call it the MKS system for meters, kilogram, second, even though kilogram, like I said, is not really the base because it's already got a prefix on it. And then you can make that, uh, you can represent larger numbers by putting a prefix in front of the base. So you could put a, a capital D in front of the M to make decameter. Or you can put a lowercase h in front of the second to make a hectosecond. Or you can put a lowercase k in front of a gram to make kilogram. And then there's other ones too for smaller numbers. So that's what I'm going to go over now. So let me share my screen with you. And I'm going to give you again some kind of crazy mnemonic. Uh, that that I've made up, but I encourage you to make up your own because, like I said, I am uh, chronically in middle school, so I want I want more adult type stuff to do <laughs> to be said. Okay, all right. So I'm doing sharing my iPad. I don't know why it's doing that now. And now it's asking me something it didn't ask me before, so I'm not sure what's going on here. Okay, now I'm going to go over to here and here. Dang it, it's saying it again. Crap. Okay, let me see what I can do. Let's try one more time now. Let's do share screen. Now I'm going to try this, go back to here. Ah, there it is. Ooh, scare me. Okay, I got it done this time. Oh, that was scary. Okay. <laughs> I hate to ruin class. All right, here's uh, the mnemonic I use. I say the dot dot great. And then I say dot dot. Hold on a second. I'm going to put my glass on. The dot dot great dot dot monarch dot dot and those dots are important that's why i'm saying them king henry died by because this is the base this little line right here is where the base goes dr died by drinking chocolate milk and the next thing is a greek letter mu that looks like a u so I'm going to call that under, and here's where the wheels fall off. Numerous, let's say a P word for ladies of the night, maybe. Okay. So uh, again, that's a mnemonic I have. I've made up other ones, but that one sticks in my head really well. So uh, we can sort of stick with that. Now, what is this? These are the metric pre prefixes. These are the system international, which has also been called the metric system. And 
Uh, from left to right, they are Terra, T-E-R-A, Giga, or if you've watched uh, Back to the Future, you might call it Jiga. Capital M is Mega, and then Kilo, Hecto, Deca. And then the base unit would be like a gram or a meter or a second or a Kelvin or a uh, Celsius or something like that. And then Desi and then Centi. Centi is the, probably the most reasonable one because just like uh, a dollar, how many cents are in a dollar? It's an easy 100. question. 100. Yeah, 100. And there's, in fact, 100 centimeters in a meter. So that one makes some sense. And then the M is milli. And then dot, dot, the Greek letter mu, M-U, is micro. And then dot, dot, nano. And then dot, dot, pico. So those are the prefixes. And if you write them this way, and you're doing work, say, like in a biology class, you don't have to be that fast at converting things. If you're in a physics or a chemistry class, you do not want to do it this way. But I could say, for instance, let's convert 0 0.0000000481 tera meters convert it to micrometers, okay? Now, here's how we do this. And notice I'm counting the moves. I'm not counting the endpoints. I'm counting the moves. So currently, I have a decimal right there between that first zero and the second zero. And notice how I put the zeros in pods of three. If you're ever turning in a handwritten thing and it's got, it's got multiple zeros in it, Make sure you group them in, in pods of three. And I don't, I don't care if you do it the proper way, like you do it from left to right or right to left. I just make sure you pod it in three so it's easy for me to read. Now, I am in the Terra area. So what I'm going to do is start from the Terra area and start counting the moves I make. I got to go one. That's one move. Uh Two moves, three moves, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. I've got to move it 18 spaces to the right. Notice I moved to the right. So that tells me not only how many spaces, but it tells me exactly which direction. So now I'm going to move this decimal 18 places to the right. So that'd be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Whoa. Seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. That's where I got to move it. So I'm going to write four, eight, one. And then I got one, two, three, four, five, six zeros after that. So that is the number written in micrometers. So this method actually works, okay? But it's not the way we do things in, in, in a class where you're trying to do something fast, right? And, and, you know, we do a lot of calculations at any one sitting in physics, so we can't afford that time to do this. What we have to realize is each one of these letters or dots is a change from left to right by, by an increase of a factor of 10. So this base right here is 10 to the zero. So that's like the ones place in, in numbers uh, 523, the three is in the ones place, okay? Now this one is 10 to the one, and this one is 10 to the two, and this one's 10 to the three, and then four, five, 10 to the sixth, seven, eight, 10 to the ninth, nine, 10, or excuse me, 10, 11 is 10 to the 12th. Similarly, 
This one is 10 to the negative one, which would be one tenth. This one's 10 to the negative two, which would be one over 100. And this one's 10 to the negative three, which would be one over 1,000. This is 10 to the negative six, 10 to the negative nine, and 10 to the negative 12. So by writing it out that way with the dots, you can immediately figure out what these uh, prefixes mean. So for instance, one tera meter is in fact equal to 10 to the ninth, or excuse me, 10 to the 12th. meters is equal to one terameter. So these numbers 10 to the 12th represent what you put in front of the meter or in front of the base to get rid of the uh, prefix. Similarly, uh, one hectosecond means uh, 100 seconds is equal to one hectosecond. Another thing is uh, one deci, let's say deci Kelvin, is actually equal to 10 to the negative one Kelvin. One micrometer is equal to 10 to the negative six meters. So that's how all that stuff can be used. Uh, to convert units, but I haven't given you the major tool yet to convert units. The key to at least certain types of units to converting units is that uh, you can't change the value of the number or you're not changing, you're not converting units, you're actually changing the value of the number. And if you're going to multiply, the only thing you can multiply a number one by without changing its value is by multiplying it by one. So you've got to realize that one can be written many, many ways. For instance, one can be written as one over one, or one can be written as three over three, or pi over pi even. Let's get a little more, I don't know, crazy, and let's say one foot over 12 inches. Is that a representation of one? Yeah, it has to be because the top has to equal the bottom. But that also shows you that I could write 12 inches over one foot, and that two is one, okay? That also means I could write, for instance, one terameter equals 10 to the 12th meters, or 10 to the 12th meters equals one terameter. So that's the way we're really going to convert units is we're going to choose a value of one that has a unit in it that will cancel the unit we have and leave the unit that we want, or at least a, a unit that's closer to what we want. Okay. So for instance, if I were to convert from a uh, four point Here's scientific notation, 4.81 times 10 to the negative 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. That's 10 to the negative 10th tera meters. If I want to convert that to actual micrometers, just like I did above, I'm going to first multiply it by 1. So to make sure you know where everything is, it might be helpful to write this over 1 because you can always write a number over 1 and it's still the same number. That way you get that this number is actually in the numerator. Now, we found that one terameter is equal to 10 to the 12th meters. I want to get rid of terameters, so that means I need to put the terameter in the bottom. And that means i got to put 10 to the 12th meters on the top, and now I've got the terameters canceling out. So I am closer to the micrometer, but not quite. Now, I need another fraction another value of one, uh, but this one's got to get rid of the meter and give me micrometers. 
Well, we know by that table that one micrometer is 10 to the negative six meters. So I can say one micrometer equals 10 to the negative six meters. Or I could say it another way around. Notice that exponent of a negative number just means you can make that exponent positive by putting it on the other side of the fraction bar. So I could also say that there's a million micrometers is equal to one meter. So I could put the 10 to the six on the top and just have one on the bottom if I wanted. Both work. What you see, though, is I'm ultimately going to multiply by 10 to the 18th power because when I pull the 10 to the 6 up to the top, it's going to become 10 to the positive 6 instead of 10 to the negative 6. And if I multiply 10 to the negative 6, or excuse me, 10 to the positive 6 from uh, by 10 to the 12th, I get 10 to the 18th. Okay? 10 to the 18th times 10 to the negative 10 gives me 10 to the negative 8. So I'm going to say this answer is, or excuse me, gives me 10 to the 8. So I'm going to say this answer is now 4.81 times 10 to the, again, I had 18 minus 10. So that should be 10 to the 8 micrometers, which, by the way, is the exact same thing as this is, because you can see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay. Anybody have any questions on that? Believe it or not, this is actually a really super important skill. And it's super important in, in a kind of weird way. I can tell you uh, like two pretty good stories. Uh, I was taking my first physics class in the summer of say 1990. And I had just switched from being uh, a landskeeper, a groundskeeper and a trolley driver at Crawl Light Resort to being a lifeguard. I got my lifeguard certification over the winter and I was coming back as a lifeguard and uh, on the ocean front. And the pool looked kind of bad. So I went down, I had learned a little bit about maintaining pools. Uh, I knew some things needed to be done. So I grabbed the Taylor test kit, which is this big box. It's a, a fairly expensive test kit you use for pools. And I had a manual in it. And I just sat down and started looking at the manual. In fact, I borrowed it for a couple of days, read it. It's only like 32 pages. And, you know, it's only like this big a page anyways. And I realized all of, of pool chemistry is converting units, basically. So I started leaving notes for the boss of what things to do at night if I didn't close or I would treat the thing myself if I was closing and they were like how did you how did you learn all this stuff and I told them about it and literally I went from 1990 now I'm making 15 bucks an hour as a lifeguard which is pretty good money I went to making 20 uh, over 20 bucks an hour uh just because they switched me and sent me off for training to become a certified pool operator and it was all because I had figured out how to convert units and realize that converting units is all you got to do to do your pool chemistry. I mean, you have to know what the values have to be, but you, to add the chemicals, it's just a unit conversion. So that's one thing. Another thing was I uh, left uh, a, a certain job I had. I was working as an uh, electrical engineer and a software engineer. And then 9-11 came along and I lost my job, uh, mainly because we had to plead no contest to software piracy and stuff like that. But anyways, I went back home. And I, I knew I wanted to do some structural engineering. I liked building and plus I loved structural engineering. So I applied at a, at a firm for engineering and gave them my resume and they hired me uh, like the next day for surveying. And I was doing surveying. I loved it. It was neat, somewhat mathematical. You're outside, you get to see animals and scenery and stuff like that. But they had done about three years ago, they had planned and created and designed a wastewater treatment plant in Kill Devil Hills. And in the intervening period, they're finally building it. And the local health inspector guy uh, starts looking at our pumps when he's putting them in. And he sends our engineer this calculation and says, I think our pumps are, are, are insufficient to process the water. I don't know anything about processing water to make it clean from sewage and stuff like that. But the weird thing was my engineer 
uh, had seen my resume and saw I had what's called an ABD and a PhD, basically all but dissertation was done, which is not really that close to a PhD, by the way. But he saw that I had done that in physics and he asked me if I could help him. I said, well, what are you working on? He said, well, here's the book that everybody uses. He hands me this book that's like uh, several, uh, like four or five inches thick. It's this huge, huge book. Uh, and it's called Metcalf and Eddie. And he says, all right, here's this book. Here's this email. Uh, this guy says our aerators aren't sufficient for what we're doing. Uh, maybe you can look at Metcalf and Eddie and, and see what he's on to. Well, I open up Metcalf and Eddie. I see this guy's working with something called BOD5. Uh, so I look up BOD5 and Metcalf and Eddie. And on that page, uh, there's the calculation that the guy had done. Only the calculation that the book was doing was with an entirely different parameter. So he just sort of blindly took this calculation and did it for one variable instead of the other. Well, I flipped around and used the uh, found uh, the actual equation that he needed to use, did that calculation and found out that we were probably about 25% over aerated, which is a, a good thing. We actually had a margin of error that was quite nice. So I wrote that up, gave it to my engineer. And again, I went in this case from like 18 bucks an hour as a surveyor to like 24 bucks an hour as a assistant engineer. And basically it was all unit conversion. So that calculation to, to calculate BOD5 and the nitrogen fraction and stuff like that, that's all unit conversions again. So you'll be surprised at the stuff you can do and the money you can save by knowing how to convert units. One example is if you have a lawnmower, well, maybe not a lawnmower, they're not doing that so much anymore. But if you have a weed eater or a chainsaw or a leaf blower, they either use 40 to one or they use 50 to one. And what that means is gas to oil ratio. Well, if you beat that uh, G-man all up, you'll figure out that one gallon is equal to 120 eight ounces by unit conversion, believe it or not. And then you just say, okay, if I'm going to treat a gallon, then I want to divide, uh, let's say 128 ounces by 40. Because I want 40 parts gas and one part oil. Well, I see that 40 goes into 108 uh, th or three times for 120. And then I have eight fortieths, which is 0.2. So it's 3.2 ounces of oil that I need. Guess what? If you walk into Home Depot, they sell oil in little boxes or little containers out this big that are 3.2 ounces. And guess what you're paying? You're paying for your inability to do math by paying probably 400% the cost of the oil to put in your weed eater. They also sell the one for 50 to one, which notice 50 to one would get you about 50 goes into a hundred, two times goes into 28, a little less than a half a, or a little more than a half a time. So it's about uh, 2.56 uh, ounces. And lo and behold, you can walk into uh, let's say Lowe's and you'll find uh, 2.56 ounces of oil sold in little bottles like this, again, at a markup of three, four, 500% from the cost of the oil. So there's another thing that knowing unit conversions can save you. Now, now that I've preached to the choir about unit conversions, let me show you some other ones so you'll have a, a, a good understanding of how to do things. Uh, one thing I like to do just for the fun of it, uh, my mom, I was a bad kid. I got not bad, like I'm a bad person, but I got in a lot of trouble. I graduated third from last in a class of 60 by my own reconnoitering. Uh, and that was after being given a mulligan cause you know, my, at the end of my, actually I did two freshman years and then I did a sophomore year at the end of that sophomore year. My mother said, you're getting in too much trouble. I'm moving down to North Carolina. So I got a mulligan. I got to start all over with my grades because we didn't get the grades from North Carolina. I mean, from Virginia when I came to North Carolina and I still graduated third from last. But when I got here, uh, I started going to school, of course, and I didn't straighten up till my senior year. So things got a little better. But one of the things my mom always complained about was your mouth is running a mile a minute. And y'all are feeling it right now, of course. So what does a mile per minute mean? Well, that means one mile per minute. Let's convert that to miles per hour just for the heck of it. 
So I'm going to say I want to convert this to miles per hour. Uh, of course, you know how many minutes there are in an hour. Anybody? 60. 60. So if I write 60 minutes up here and one hour down here, then you can see the minute crosses out with the minute, and I end up getting 60 miles per hour. Okay. So that's what a mile per minute means. And that's a helpful thing. If you travel much, you know, when you're on the interstate, it's not unreasonable to assume you're traveling at an average speed of about 60 miles per hour. Sometimes it's more like 52 because some jerks in front of you, or sometimes it's like 70. But as a first order approximation, you can pretend it's 60. So if you're at exit 250, if you're at exit 250, I don't know what's going on right now. Something crazy is happening. Uh, my computer just started spitting things and asking me for all sorts of stuff. I guess I laid on a card or something. But anyways, I want to pretend going like I can. So if you're at, say, exit 250 and the exits are getting higher and higher in number and you need to get off at exit 278, well, you know, exit 278 is about 28 miles from you at exit 250. So you can estimate I'm going to be turning in about 28 minutes. So that's another thing where that's useful. Anybody have any questions on that? All right, so now let's show another conversion. Let's convert 60 miles per hour. And I'm gonna do it really fancy. I'm gonna say 60.0000 miles. And then I'm gonna go ahead and write it as one over hours here, okay? Now I did all those sig figs because this particular way of converting that I'm doing gives me exactly the right result. So if I put in 12 sig figs, I get out 12 sig figs. So first off, I'm gonna realize that one mile is equal to 5,280 feet. Okay, so I'll mark an X a, a slash through my mile and now I see I have feet per hour. Well, now I'm gonna realize that one foot is equal to 12 inches. So now I'll mark from the top left to the bottom right. Notice how I'm using a different mark each time. That way, if you accidentally misread your writing and you cross out the wrong thing, when you get the wrong answer, you can immediately find out what mistake you made because you have a different hash mark each time you did it. So now I'm uh, up to inches per hour. Well, this is where I can cross over to the metric system because I realized that one inch is exactly 2.54 centimeters. And that's an exact figure to any number of decimal places. So, so far all these conversions have been exact. Now I can see, okay, well the inch is gonna cancel out. I'm gonna do a squiggly wave like that and I'll do a squiggly wave like that. And that's why the inches canceled out. Now I can go from inches to meters because really what I want is meters per second. That's the unit that we're gonna use in this class because that's the SI base unit. So I happen to know that 100 centimeters is equal to one meter. So now I'm up to meters per hour and I'm gonna do a squiggly this way. Now I'm up to meters per hour. Now all I have to do is say that one hour is equal to 60 minutes and 60 minutes is equal to 60 or is equal to uh, 60 minutes equal to one hour and 60 seconds is equal to one minute. So 60 times 60 is 3,600 seconds. Notice how the hour here was on the bottom. So to get rid of it, I needed to put the hour on the top in this last number. So how do we do this type of calculation? It looks foreboding, right? Well, it's really not that hard. What I tell students to do is multiply all the numerators to get the new numerator, and then multiply all the denominators to get the new denominator. So if I multiply all the numerators, I'm gonna take 60, and notice that is a 60, that's not 60 million or some crazy number, that's just a plain 60. So I'm gonna take 60, and I'm gonna multiply it by 5,280. And I'm gonna multiply that by 12. 
And I'm gonna multiply that by 2.54 and then times one and then times one. And I'm gonna get uh, nine, six, five, six, zero, six, zero, that many meters. And then of course I have three, six, zero, that many seconds. 